Stanford University. Okay, so we're back again with um, CS224N. Um, so let's see. So in, in terms of what we're going to do today, I mean, I, I think it's going to be a little bit um, muddled up and going forwards and backwards. Officially in the syllabus, um, today's lecture is sequence to sequence models and attention, and next Tuesday's lecture is machine translation. Um, but really, um, Richard already started saying some things about machine translation last week, and so I thought for various reasons it probably makes sense to also be saying more stuff about machine translation today, um, so expect that. Um, but I am going to cover the main content of what was meant to be in today's lecture and talk about attention today. And that's a really useful thing to know about. I mean, almost certainly, if you're going to be doing anything in the space of sort of reading comprehension question answering models, such as, for instance, assignment four, but also um, kinds of things that a whole bunch of people have proposed for final projects, you definitely want to know about and use attention. Um, but then I actually thought I'd do a little bit of going backwards next Tuesday, and I wanted to go back and actually say a bit more about these kind of gated models like the GRUs and LSTMs um, that have become popular lately and try and have a bit more of a go at saying just a little bit more about, well, why do people do this and why does it work and see if um, I can help make it a little bit more intelligible. So we'll mix around between those topics, but somehow over the, these two weeks of classes, um, we're doing recurrent models, attention, um, MT, and all those kinds of things. Okay, um, other reminders and comments. Um, so the midterm is over, yay, um, and your dear TAs and me um, spent all last night grading that midterm. Um, so we're sort of 99% over with the midterm. Um, there's this slight catch um, that a couple of people haven't done it yet because of various complications. Um, so um, essentially next Tuesday is when we're going to be able to be sort of releasing solutions to the midterm and handing them back. Um, some people did exceedingly well. The highest score was extremely high 90s. Um, most people did pretty well. It has a decent median. Um, few people not so well. Um, you know what these things are like. Um, but yeah, um, overall we were pretty pleased with how people did in it. Um, I just thought I should mention one other issue which I'll also sort of send a piazza note about. I mean, I know that a few people were quite unhappy with the fact that some students kept on writing after the official end of the exam. And I mean, I totally understand that because the fact of the matter is these kind of short midterm exams do end up quite time limited and many people feel like they could do more um, if they had more time. I mean, on the other hand, I honestly feel like I don't know quite what to do about this problem. Um, both Richard and me came from educational um, traditions where we had exam proctors and when it was time to put your pens down, you put your pens down or else dire consequences happen to you. Um, whereas my experience at Stanford is that every exam I've ever been in at Stanford, there are people who keep writing until you forcibly remove the exam out of their hands. Um, and so um, there seems to be a different tradition here. Um, and in theory, this is meant to be student regulated by the honor code, but we all know that um, the, um, there are some complications there as well. So it's not that I'm not sensitive to the issue and you know, really, um, exactly what I said to the TAs before the end of the exam is, so it's a real problem at Stanford, people going on writing, so could everyone get in the room as quickly as possible and collect everyone's exams to minimize that problem? Um, but it's obviously, it's a little bit difficult when there are 680 students. Um, but we did the best we could, and I think basically we have to um, proceed with that. Okay. Um, other topics. Um, assignment three is looming. Um, apologies that we were a bit late getting that out, um, though with the midterm it wouldn't have made much difference. We have put in a little bit of an extension to assignment three. I guess we're really nervous about 
um, giving more extension to assignment three, not because we don't want you to have time to do assignment three, but just because we realize that anything we do is effectively stealing days away from the time you have to do the final project or assignment four, so we don't want to do that too much. Um, we hope that assignment three isn't too bad and the fact that you can do it in teams can help and that that won't be such a problem. Another thing that we've been, we want people to do but are a bit behind on but are hopefully can get in place tomorrow is giving people access to Microsoft Azure to be able to use GPUs to do the assignments. We really do want people to do that for assignment three since it's just great experience to have and it'll be useful to know about for then going on for assignment four and the final project. So we hope we can have that in place imminently um, and it really will allow you to do things um, much quicker for assignment three. So the kind of models that you're building for assignment three should run at least an order of magnitude, sort of 10, 12 times or something faster if you're running them on a GPU rather than a CPU. Um, so look forward to hearing more about that. Um, the final reminder I want to mention um, is um, really, really encouraging people um, to come to um, final project office hours for discussion. Richard was really disappointed how few people came to talk to him about final projects um, on Tuesday after the exam. Now maybe that was quite understandable why no one turned up, um, but at any rate, um, moving forward from here, um, really, really encourage you to do that. Um, so I have final, final project office hours tomorrow from one to three, which is going to be doing a, again next Tuesday. The various other um, PhD students um, having their office hours. So really do for the rest of the quarter, try and get along to those and check in on projects um, as often as possible. And in particular, make really, really sure that either next week or the week after that you do talk to your project mentor to find out their advice on the project. Okay, all good, any questions? Okay, um, so let's get back into machine translation. And I just thought I'd sort of say a couple of slides of how important is machine translation. Now really a large percentage of the audience of these Stanford classes are not American citizens. So probably a lot of you realize that machine translation is important. But um, for the few of you that are native born American citizens, I think a lot of native born Americans are sort of very unaware of the importance of translation um, because they live in an English only world where most of the resources for information are available in English and America is a sort of a big enough place that you're not often dealing with stuff outside the rest of the world. But really in general for humanity and commerce, um, machine tra translation in general and machine translation in particular are just huge things, right? That for places like the European Union to run, it's completely dependent on having translation happen so it can work across the many languages of the European Union. So the translation industry is a $40 billion a year industry and that's basically the, the amount that's spent on human translation because uh, most of what's done as machine translation at the moment is in the form of free services. And so it's a huge issue in Europe, it's growing in Asia, lots of needs in every domain as well as commercial, their social government and military needs. And so the use of machine translation has itself become a huge thing. So Google now translates over 100 billion words per day, right? There are a lot of people that are giving um, Google stuff to translate. It's then important for things like having social connections. So, I mean, in 2016, last year, Facebook rolled out their own homegrown machine translation. Prior to that, they'd made use of other people's translation, but essentially what they'd found was that the kind of commercial machine translation offerings didn't do a very good job at translating social chit chat. And the fact of the matter is that doing a better job at that is sufficiently important to a company like Facebook that they're developing their own in-house 
in-house um, machine translation to do it. And um, one of the quotes that came along with that was when they were testing it and they turned off the machine translation for some users, um, that they really went nuts, that lots of people really do actually depend on this. Um, other areas as well, so eBay makes extensive use of machine translation to uh, enable cross-border trade so that if you're going to be able to successfully um, sell products in different markets, well, you have to be able to translate the descriptions into things that people can read. Okay, and so that lean, then leads us into what we're going to be focusing on here, which is neural machine translation. And so, um, Neural Machine Translation, or NMT, is a sort of a commonly used slogan name. And it's come to have a sort of a particular meaning that's slightly more than Neural plus Machine Translation. That Neural Machine Translation is used to mean what we want to do is build one big neural network which we can train the entire end-to-end -end machine translation process in and optimize end-to-end. -end. And so systems that do that are then what are referred to as NMT systems. So that the kind of picture here is that we're going to have this big neural network, it's going to take input text, it's somehow going to encode into neural network vectors, it's then going to have a decoder, um, and out will come text at the end. So we get these encoder-decoder architectures. Um, before getting into the modern stuff, I thought I'd take two slides um, to tell you about the archaeology of neural networks. Um, the, the sort of um, neural networks had sort of been very marginal or dead as a field for a couple of decades. And so I think a lot of the time people these days think of deep learning, it turned up around 2012 with the ImageNet breakthroughs, and boy has it been amazing since then. Um, but really there have been earlier ages of neural networks, and in particular there was a boom in the use of neural networks in the second half of the 80s into the early 90s, which corresponds to when Rumelhart and McClelland, and so that's the J. McClelland that's still in the psych department, at Stanford um, pioneered or re-pioneered the use of neural networks, partly as a cognitive science tool, but also as a computing tool. And many of the technologies that we've been talking about, really the math of them were worked out during that period. So it was in the 80s that was really worked out of how to do general backpropagation algorithms um, for um, multi-layer neural networks. And it was also during that period when people worked out how to do the math of recurrent neural networks. So algorithms like backpropagation propagation through time were worked out um, in this period um, in the late 80s, often by people who were psychologists, cognitive scientists, rather than hardcore um, CS people in those days. And so also in that period was actually um, when um, neural MT in having these encoder-decoder architectures for doing translation was first tried out. Um, the systems that were built were incredibly um, primitive and limited, um, which uh, partly reflects the computational resources of those days, but they still were encoder-decoder architectures. So as far as I've been able to work out, the first um, neural MT system was this system um, that was done by Bob Allen in 1987, at the very first international conference and neural networks. And so he constructed 3,000 English-Spanish pairs over a tiny vocabulary, a sort of a 30 to 40 word vocabulary. And the sentences were actually kind of constructed based on a grammar. It wasn't actually kind of real, just um, collect together human language use. But you know, you sort of had sentences like this with some variation of word order and things like that. And he built this um, simple encoded decoder network that you can see on the right that was not a recurrent model. You just had sort of a, rep a binary representation of the sequence of words in the sentence, and the sentences were only short, um, and then were um, pumped through that. Um, a few years um, after that, Lonnie Chrisman. Um, Lonnie Chrisman's actually a guy who lives in the Bay Area. He works at a tech firm um, still to this day. Um, not doing neural networks anymore. Um, so Lonnie Chrisman um, in the early 90s then developed a more sophisticated um, neural network architecture for doing encoder-decoder um, MT architecture. Um, so he was using this model called RAMS, um, recursive auto-associative memories which were developed 
um, the early 90s. Um, not worth explaining the details of them, but a RAM is in some sense kind of like a re recurrent network of the kind that we've already started to look at, um, and he was building those ones. And so that then leads into our modern encoder-decoder architectures that Richard already mentioned, where we're having um, perhaps a recurrent network that's doing the encoding, and then another recurrent network that is then decoding out in another language. And where in reality, they're not normally as simple as this, and we have more layers and more stuff, and it all gets more complicated. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly a teeny, couple more things about the space of these things. So you can think of what these encoder-decoder architectures are as a conditional recurrent language model. So if we want to generate a translation, um, we're encoding the source, so we're producing a Y from the source, and then we're from that Y, we're going to decode we're going to run a recurrent neural network to produce the translation. And so you can think of that um, decoder there as a conditional recurrent language model. So it's essentially being a language model that's generating forward as a recurrent language model. And the only difference from any other kind of recurrent or neural language model is that you're conditioning on one other thing, that you've calculated this Y based on the source sentence. And that's the only architecture difference. So if we then look down into the details a little bit, um, there are different ways that you can do the encoder. I mean, the most common way to do the encoder has been with these gated recurrent units, whether the GRUs or the LSTMs, which are another kind of gated recurrent um, unit that Richard talked about last time. I mean, people have tried other things. Um, in the modern resurgence, of neural machine translation. Actually, the very first paper that tried to do it was this paper by um, now Karl Brenner and Phil Bunsom, who now both work at DeepMind. And they actually, for their encoder, they were using a recurrent sequence of convolutional networks, not the kind of gated recurrent networks that we talked about. And sometime later in the course, um, we'll talk a bit more about convolutional networks and how they're used in language. They're not nearly as much used in language. They're much, much more used in vision. And so if next quarter you do CS231N and get even more neural networks, um, then you'll spend way more of the time on convolutional networks. Um, but the one other idea I sort of wanted to just sort of put um, out there as sort of another concept um, to be aware of. So we have this Y that we've um, encoded um, the source with, and then there's this question of how you use it. So for the models that we've shown up until now and that Richard had, essentially what happened was we calculated up to here, um, this was our Y, and we just used the Y as the starting point of the hidden layer, and then we started to decode. And so this was effectively the Google tradition of the way of doing it, the model that Sutske et al. Um, proposed in 2014. And so effectively, if you're doing it this way, you're putting most of the pressure on the forget gates not doing too much forgetting because you have the entire knowledge of the source sentence here um, and you have to make sure you're carrying enough of it along through the network that you'll be able to continue to access the source sentences semantics all the way through your generation of the target sentence. Um, so it's especially true in that case that you will really lose badly if you've got something like a plain recurrent neural network, which isn't very good at having a medium term memory, and you can do much better with something like an LSTM, which is much more able to maintain a medium term memory with the sort of ideas that Richard started to talk about. Um, but that isn't actually the only way of doing it. And so the other pioneering work in neural machine translation um, was work that was done at the University of Montreal by Kyung Hyun Cho and colleagues. And that wasn't actually the way they did it. The way they did it was once they'd calculated the Y as the representation of the source, they fed that Y into 
every time step during the period of generation. So when you were generating at each state, you were getting a hidden representation, which was kind of just your language model, and then you were getting two inputs. You were getting one input, which was the previous word, the XT, and then you were getting a second input, which was the Y that you were conditioning on. So you were directly feeding that conditioning in at every time step, and so you, then you're less dependent on having to sort of preserve it along the whole sequence. And in a way, having the input available at every time step, that seems to be a useful idea. And so that's actually the idea that will come back when I talk about attention. That attention is again going to give us a different mechanism of getting at the input when we need it and to being able to condition on it. Um, let me just sort of um, give you a couple more um, pictures in a sense of how exciting neural machine translation has been. So here is, um, so for machine translation, the, there are a couple of prominent evaluations of machine translation that are done. But I mean, I think the most prominent one has been done by what's called the Workshop on Machine Translation, which has a yearly evaluation. And so this is showing results from that. And most of the results shown are the results from Edinburgh systems. And the University of Edinburgh has traditionally been one of the strongest universities at doing machine translation, and that they have several systems. And so what we can see from these results so up is good of machine translation quality is, so we have the phrase-based syn syntactic machine translation systems, which is the kind of thing that you saw in Google Translate until November 2016, that although they work reasonably, there is sort of a feeling that although they are pioneering and good use of large data um, machine learning systems, that sort of, um, that kind of stalled. So there really was very little progress in phrase-based machine translation systems in recent years. Um, until neural machine translation came along, the idea that people were most actively exploring was building syntax-based um, statistical machine translation systems, which made more use of the structure of language. Um, they were improving a little bit more quickly, but not very quickly. How quickly kind of partly depends on how you draw that line. It sort of depends on whether you believe 2015 was a fluke or um, whether I should draw the line as I have in the middle um, between them. But you've got slightly more slope, but not a lot. But so compared to those two things, I mean, actually just this amazing thing happened with neural machine translation. So it was only in 2014 after the WMT evaluation that people started playing with, could we build an end-to-end -end neural machine translation system? Um, but then extremely quickly, people were able to build these systems. And so by 2016, they were clearly winning in the um, workshop and machine translation. And um, in terms of how much slope you have for improvement, that the slope is extremely high. And indeed, the numbers are kind of continuing to go up um, to in the last year. So that's actually been super exciting that you've, um, as I say in the next slide, that so neural MT really went from this sort of, um, sort of um, fringe research activity of let's try this and see if it could possibly work in 2014 to two years later. Um, it had become this is the way that you have to do machine translation because it just works um, better than everything else. Um, so I'll say more about machine translation, but I thought I'd just highlight at the beginning, well, why do we get these big wins from neural machine translation? And I think there are maybe sort of four big wins. At any rate, this is my attempt at dividing it up. So the first big win is the fact that you're just training these models end to end. So if you can train all parameters of the model simultaneously for one target driven loss function, that's just proved a really powerful notion. And in Indeed, I think quite a lot of the success of deep learning systems is that because we have these sort of big um, computational flow graphs that we can optimize everything over in one big um, um, back propagation process, so it's easy to do end-to-end -end training, that that's um, been a very productive way to do end-to-end -end training. And it's the end-to-end -end training more than 
neural nets are magical. I think sometimes it has given an enormous amount of power to these systems. But there are other factors as well. So as we stressed a lot, these distributed representations are actually just worth a ton. So that they allow you to kind of share statistical strength between similar words, similar phrases, and you can exploit that to just get better predictions. And that's given a lot of improvement. A third big cause of improvement has been these neural MT systems are just much better at exploiting context. Um, so Richard briefly mentioned traditional language models. So those were things like four gram and five gram models, which were just done on counts of how often sequences of words occurred. And you know, those were very useful parts of machine translation systems. But the reality was that the language models on the generation side only used a very short context. And when you're translating words and phrases, that the standard systems did that completely context free. So the neural machine translation systems are just able to use much more context and that means that they can do a lot better. And there's an interesting way in which these things kind of go together in a productive way. So precisely the reason why neural machine translation systems can practically use much more context is because there are these distributed representations that allow you to share statistical strength. Effectively, you could never use more context in traditional systems because you are using these one hot representations of words and therefore you couldn't build more than five gram models usefully because because you're just being killed by the sparseness of the data. And then the fourth one thing that I want to call out is sort of really re related to all of one, two, or three, but I think it's just sort of worth calling out is something really powerful that's happened in the last couple of years with neural NLP methods is that they've proven to be just be extremely good for generating fluent text. So I th think it's fair to say that the field of sort of natural language generation was sort of fairly moribund in the 2000s decade because although there were sort of simple things that you can do, you know, writing a printf, that's a text generation method, um, but people could do a bit better than that with um, grammar driven text generation and so on. But there really weren't a lot of good ideas as how to do, produce really good high quality natural language generation. Whereas um, it's just proven extremely easy and productive to do high quality natural language generation using these neural language models because it's very easy for them to use big context, condition on other goals at the same time, and they work really well. And so one of the big reasons why neural machine translation has been so successful and the results look very good is that the text that they're generating is very fluent. In fact, it's sometimes the case that the actual quality of the translation is worse, but the quality of the generation in terms of fluency is much better. It's also worth knowing what's not on that list. Um, so one thing that's not on that list that's a good thing is we don't have any separate black box component models for things like reordering and transliteration and things like that. And um, traditional statistical MT systems have lots of these separate components. You had lexicalized reordering components and distortion models and um, this models and that models. And getting rid of all of that with this end-to-end -end, um, system is great. Um, there are some other things that are not so great that our current NMT models really make no use of any kind of explicit syntax or semantics. You could sort of say, well, maybe some interesting stuff is happening inside the word vectors and maybe it is. Well, sorry, the, the recurrent hidden state vectors and maybe it is, um, but it's sort of unclear. And actually this is something that's started to be worked on. There have been a couple of papers that have come out just this year where people are starting to put more syntax into neural machine translation models and are getting gains from doing so. So I think that's something um, that will um, revive itself. Also another huge failing of machine translation has been a lot of the errors are that higher level textual notions are really badly done by machine translation systems. So those are things of sort of discourse structure, clause linking, anaphora and things like that. And we haven't solved those ones. Um, yeah, so that's been the general picture. Um, before going on, I, 
Um, one of the things we haven't done very much of in this class is actually looking at linguistic examples and having language on slides. So I thought I'd do at least one sentence of machine translation and I kind of guess that the highest density of knowledge of another language in my audience is Chinese. Um, so we're doing Chinese. Um, and um, this, is my, um, this is my one sentence um, test set um, for Chinese to English machine translation. Um, so I guess back in the mid 2000s, um, we were doing um, Chinese to English machine translation and there was this evaluation that we did kind of badly on and one of the sentences that we translated terribly was this sentence. And ever since then I've been using this as my one sentence evaluation set. So I guess this sentence, it actually comes, I mean, it actually comes from Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. So in a sense, it's sort of a funny one since it's starting with the Chinese translation of Jared Diamond's text, and then we're trying to translate it back into English. But never mind, that's our sentence for um, now. Um, so what have we got here? So this is the 1519 year. Um, there were 600 Spanish people, and they're landing in Mexico. Um, and then we've got to conquer. And the first bit I want to focus on is then this next bit, bit here. So um, the several million population of the Aztec Empire. And so what you get in Chinese is, oops. Um, so here's our Aztec Empire. So in general in Chinese, all modifiers of a noun are appearing before the noun. And Chinese has this really handy little morpheme right here, the de, which is saying the thing that comes before, this is saying the thing that comes before it's shown in that brownish color is a modifier of this noun that follows it. Um, and this one's saying the sort of several million population. So it's the Aztec empire with a population of a few million. And there's this very specific linguistic marker that tells you how you're meant to translate it. Um, and then after that, um, we've then got the part here um, where then we've got sort of first time confronted them, um, losses, two thirds. Um, and so that's just sort of tacked on to the end of the sentence that they lost two thirds of their soldiers in the first clash. Um, this is just an interesting thing in how translation works. So you could, in an English translation, try and tack that onto the end of the sentence and sort of say, um, losing two thirds of their soldiers in the first clash or, and they lost two thirds of the soldiers in the first clash. But neither of those sound very good in English. Um, so below here, what we have is the reference translation, which is where we got some competent human to translate this. And so interestingly, what they did, and I think correctly actually here, is that they decided, gee, it'd actually be much better to make this into two sentences. And so they put in a period and then they made a second sentence. They lost two thirds of their soldiers in the first clash. Okay, um, so I won't tell you our bad translation, um, but every year since I've been running this sentence through Google, and so I'll show you the Google translations. Um, so in 2009, this is what Google produced, um, 1519, 600 Spaniards landed in Mexico. So that starts not very good, but if we go in particular to this focus part, millions of people to conquer the Aztec Empire. No, that's not correct. And well, it's getting some of the words right, but it's completely not making any use of the sort of structure um, of the sentence in Chinese. And it doesn't get much better. The first two thirds of soldiers against their loss. No. Okay, so we can go on to 2011. I sort of left some of them out so the font size stayed vaguely readable. Um, so it changes a bit, but not really. 1519, 600 Spaniards land in Mexico, millions of people to conquer the Aztec Empire. The initial loss of soldiers, two thirds of their encounters. So that last bit's maybe a fraction better, but the rest of it's no better. 
In 2013, it seemed like they might have made a bit of progress. 1519, 600 Spaniards landed in Mexico to conquer the Aztec Empire, hundreds of millions of people. It's unclear if it's made progress. The fact that you can read the to conquer the Aztec Empire as meaning the Spaniards sort of means it might have made some progress, but then after that they just dumped the hundreds of millions of people between two commas, and so it's really not quite clear what that's doing. Um, but it sort of seemed like whatever that changed, it was just kind of luck, um, because in 2014 it sort of switched back. 15, 19, 600 Spaniards landed in Mexico, millions of people to conquer the Aztec Empire, the first two thirds of the loss of soldiers they clash. Um, and um, not only that, interestingly, um, when I ran it again in 2015 and 2016, the translation didn't change at all. So I don't know what all the people were doing on the Google MT <laughs> translation team in 2015 and 2016, but they definitely weren't making progress in Chinese translation. And I think this sort of reflects the sit the feeling that the system wasn't really progressing, that they'd sort of built the models and mined all the data they could for their um, um, Chinese English MT system. It wasn't getting um, very any better. Um, so then in late 2016, Google rolled out their neural machine translation system, which we're going to hear more about in a moment. And there's actual and distinct signs of progress. So in 1519, 600 Spaniards landed in Mexico. So the beginning of it is a lot better because, you know, the whole time it had just been plonking down 1519, 600, which wasn't a very um, promising beginning. So, I mean, in the Chinese, there's no word for in, right? So this character here is year, right? So it's sort of 1519 year, 600 people, um, Spanish people, right? But clearly in English, you want to be putting an in there and say in 1519, but somehow Google had never managed to get that right, whereas you might have thought it could. Um, but now it is, right? In 1519, comma, great beginning. Um, and it continues much better. Um, 600 Spaniards landed in Mexico to conquer the millions of people of the Aztec Empire. This is getting really good. Neural machine translation is much, much better. Um, but there is still some work to do. I guess this last part is kind of difficult in a sense, the way it's sort of tacked on to the end of the um, sentence. But at any rate, it still isn't working very well for that because they've just tacked on the first confrontation, they killed two thirds, which sort of it seems to be the wrong way around because that's suggesting they killed two thirds of the Aztecs, whereas meant to be the, um, that they lost two thirds of the Spaniards. So, so there's still work to be done from proving neural machine translation. Um, but I do actually think that that's showing very genuine progress and that's in general um, what's been shown. So neural machine translation has just given big gains. It's been aggressively rolled out by industry. So actually the first people who rolled out um, neural machine translation was Microsoft. So in um, February 2016, Microsoft launched neural machine translation on Android phones, no less. And another of the huge selling points of neural machine translation systems is that they're actually massively more compact so that they were able to build a neural machine translation system that actually ran on the cell phone. And actually that's a very useful use case because the commonest time when people want machine translation is when they're not in their home country. And at that point it depends, but a lot of people don't actually have cell plans that work in foreign countries at decent prices. And so it's really useful to be able to run your MT system just on the phone. And that was sort of essentially never possible with the huge kind of lookup tables of phrase-based systems, but is now possible. Um, Systrans and a veteran old MT company, they also launched a system and then um, Google launched their um, neural machine translation system with massively more hype than either of the two predecessors, including some huge overclaims of equaling human translation quality, which we've just seen still isn't true based on my one sentence test set, that they still have some work to do. Um, but on the other hand, um, they, did, um, they did publish a really interesting paper on the novel research that they've done on neural machine translation. And so for the research highlight today, Emma is gonna talk about that. Hi, 
Hi. Um, today I'm going to talk about Google's multilingual NMT system, which enables zero-shot translation. So as we have seen in the lecture, this is the standard architecture for uh, an MT system, which we have an encoder and a decoder. However, this standard architecture supports only bilingual translation, meaning that we can have only one specific source language and one specific target language. So what if we want to have a system that's able to do multilingual translation, meaning that we have multiple source languages and multiple target languages? So previously, people have proposed several different approaches. Um, the first one, they proposed to have multiple different encoders and multiple different decoders, where each pair uh, correspond to one specific pair of source and target languages. And the second one, they proposed to have a shared encoder that works for one specific source language, but have different decoders to decode into different uh, target languages. And they also have proposed this, uh, the third one is they have multiple different encoders to work for different source languages and one uh, single shared decoder to work for one specific target language. So what's so sp uh, special about Google's multilingual uh, NMT system? So first of all, it's really simple because here we only need one single model that is able to translate from different langu uh, source languages to different target languages. And because of the simplicity, um, the system can trivially scale up to more language pairs. And second, um, the system improves the translation quality for low resource language. Um, so because the parameters of the model are shared implicitly, and so the model is forced to generalize across language boundaries. So it's observed that if we train the language that has very little training data with the language pairs that have a lot of training data in uh, one single model, the system um, the translation quality for the low resource language is significantly improved. And also the system is able to perform zero shot translation, meaning that the model can implicitly translate uh, for the language pairs it has never seen during training time. For example, if we train a model on uh, Portuguese, to Spanish, uh, Portuguese to English and English to Spanish uh, data, uh, the model is able to generate reasonable translation for Portuguese to Spanish directly without seeing any data uh, for the language pair during training time. And this is the architecture for the model. As we can see, this is kind of just a standard architecture for the uh, state-of-the-art NMT system, where we have like multiple uh, stacked layers of STMs for both decoders and encoders, and they also apply the attention mechanism, which we will talk about later in the lecture. So what is the magic here that enables the system to do a multilingual translation? So it turns out that instead of trying to modify the architecture, they instead modify the input data uh, by adding the special artificial token at the beginning of every input sentence to indicate what uh, target language we want to translate to. So for example, if we want to translate from English to Spanish, we simply add this 2ES token to indicate that Spanish is the target language. And after adding this uh, artificial token, we simply just put together all of the multilingual data and just start training. Um, with this uh, similarly uh, simple trick, the system is able to uh, surpass the CVR performance for English to German, French to English, and German to English uh, translation. And it has comparable performance for English to French translation, Bo both on the MWMT uh, benchmark. So, and here's a little more detail about a zero-shot translation. Um, the setting is like this. So during training time, we train a model on Portuguese to English and English to Spanish data. But during test time, we ask the model to perform Portuguese to Spanish translation directly. And in, it's shown here that the model is able to have um, comparable performance as the phrase-based machine translation system and also the NMT system with bridging. And also with a little bit of incremental training, meaning that we add a little bit of data uh, for the Portuguese to Spanish uh, uh, translation, the model is able to surpass uh, all of the other models listed above. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that actually is a really amazing result. I mean, it's, you know, um, in some sense, it's actually realizing a long-held dream of machine translation. So a traditional problem with machine translation has 
always been that if you'd like to be able to translate between a lot of languages, or well, you're then in a product space of number of systems, right? So if you'd like to support around 80 languages as Google does, that if you want to allow translation between any pair straightforwardly, you have to build 6,400 machine translation systems, and that's a lot of machine translation systems. And you know, they never quite did that. That was the reference to bridging. So if something was being bridged, what that effectively meant for Google was you were translating twice via an intermediate language, where the intermediate language was normally English. So the goal is, for a long time has been an MT is to achieve this dream of an inter lingua, so that if you had an interlingua in the middle, you have to only trans be able to translate each language to and from the interlingua, so you only need 80 encoders and 80 decoders, so it's then the number of languages. And that has sort of never been very successful, which is why effectively people just sort of build all of these bilingual systems. But this system is now sort of illustrating how you can actually have the encodings of a neural MT system be an effective interlingua. Okay, so now onto the main technical um, content to get through today is introducing this idea of attention. So what's the problem we wanna deal with? So if we're in the sort of vanilla sequence to sequence encoder decoder model, we have this problem because our only representation of the input is this sort of one fixed dimensional representation Y, which was sort of the state that we, our encoder was last in. And so we need to kind of carry that through our entire generation of our translation sentence. And that seems like it might be a difficult thing to do. And indeed, what was shown was that was indeed a difficult thing to do. And so what people found is that these initial neural machine translation systems worked well on short sentences, but if you tried to use them to translate very long sentences, that their um, performance started to tank, and I'll show some numbers on that later. And so the idea that people came up with and this idea was actually first proposed for vision, but was then moved over and tried for neural machine translation by Kyung Hyun Cho and colleagues at Montreal, was to say, well, what, instead of saying that our Y that we generate from is just the last hidden states, why don't we say all of the hidden states of the entire encoding process are available to us? And so we sort of have this pool of source states that we can draw from to do the translation. And so then when we're translating any particular word, we then want to work out which of those ones to draw from. So effectively, the the pool of source states becomes kind of like a random access memory which the neural network is then going to be able to retrieve from as needed when it wants to do its translation and it'll find some stuff from it and use it for translating each word. And so attention for neural machine translation is one specific instantiation of this, but in general this sort of builds into a bigger concept that has actually been um, a very exciting concept in recent neural networks research, and I know at least a couple of groups are interested in doing for their final projects, is this idea of can we augment neural networks um, with a memory on the side so that we can not only lengthen our short-term memory with an LSTM, but we can actually have a much longer-term memory that we can access stuff from as we need it. And attention is a simple form of doing that. And then some of the more recent work, like neural Turing machines, is trying to do more sophisticated forms of read-write memories augmenting neural networks. Okay, so if we want to retrieve as needed, you could think of that as saying, okay, well, out of all of this pool of source states, um, we want to be looking at where in the input we want to retrieve stuff from. So effectively, you know, after we've um, said je and we're wanting to um, translate the next word, we should be working out, well, where in here do we want to be paying attention to decide what to translate next? And if it's French, we want to be translating the am next. And so our, our attention model effectively sort of becomes like an alignment model, because it's saying, well, 
which part of the source are you next going to be translating? So you've got this implicit alignment between the source and the translation. And that just seems a good idea because, you know, that's even what human translators do. It's not that a human translator reads the whole of a big long sentence and says, okay, got it, and then starts furiously scribbling down the translation, right? They're looking back at the source as they translate and are translating different phrases of it. And so Richard mentioned um, last week the idea that in training um, statistical models that one of the first steps was you worked out these word alignments um, between the source and the target. And that was used to extract phrases that gave you kind of phrases to use in a statistical phrase-based system. Here we're not doing that. It's rather just at translation time by process of using an, this attention model, we're implicitly making connections between source and target, which gives us a kind of alignment. But nevertheless, it, you know, it effectively means that we're building this end-to-end -end neural machine translation system that's al doing alignments and translation as it works. So it achieves this NMT vision. Um, and you do get these good alignments. So here, yeah, so we're using this kind of on the right um, um, structure where we're sort of filling in where the alignments have occurred. And so you can look at where attention was um, laid when you were producing a translation of translating from here from French to English. And you can see that this model, which is a model from the people at Montreal, is doing a good job at deciding where to place attention. So it's starting off with the agreement on the, and then the interesting part is that sort of French typically has adjectival modifiers after the head noun. So this is the zone economic European, which you have to flip in English to get the European economic area. And so it's kind of correctly modeling that flip in deciding where to pay attention in the source and then kind of goes back to a more monotonic linear order. Okay, um, so that looks good. How do we go about doing that? So what we're going to be doing is we've started to generate and we want to generate the next word. And we want to use our hidden state to decide where to access our random access memory, which is all the um, blue stuff. And so, well, we haven't yet generated the hidden state for the next word. So it seems like our only good choice is to use, um, I think I skipped one. Oh, okay. The only good choice is to use the previous hidden state as the basis of attention, and that's what we do. And then what we're going to do is come up with some score that combines it and elements of the hidden state, and commonly people are only using the highest level of the hidden state for attention and decides where to pay attention. And so this scoring function will score each position and saying where to pay attention. And I'll get back to the scoring functions in a minute. And so the model that they proposed was we get a score for each component of the memory. And then what we're going to do is sort of build a representation which combines all of the memories weighted by the score. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, we'll take those scores and we'll do our standard trick. We'll stick them through a softmax function. And that will then give us a probability distribution of um, how much attention to pay to the different places in the source. And so then we're going to combine, oops, um, okay. Then we're going to combine together all of the hidden states of the encoder weighted by how much attention we're paying to it. So that we're taking these are each hidden state of the encoder, um, the amount of attention you're paying to that position, and then you're just calculating a weighted sum, and that then gives us a context vector. So now, rather than simply using the last hidden state as our representation of all of meaning, we're using the entire of our hidden states of the encoder as our representation of meaning. And at different points in time, we weight it differently to pay attention in different places. And so now what we're going to do is based on what we were, 
ah, this is going automatic on me. Now what we're going to do is based on what we were doing before, um, and so the previous hidden state and the next, and the previous word of the decoder, but also conditioned on this context vector, we're then going to generate the next word. Okay. So then the, the question is, well, how do we actually score that? Um, and at this point, we need some kind of attention function that decides how to um, work out the score. And a very simple idea you could use for that is just to say, well, let's take the dot product between the decoder hidden state and an encoder hidden state, and we want to find the ones that are similar, because that means we're in the right ballpark of words that have the same meaning and generate from that. And that's a possible thing that you could do. Um, the one that was proposed um, by the people in Montreal was this bottom one, where we're effectively using a single layer of neural net, just like the kind of functions that we've been using everywhere else inside our LSTM. So we're taking the concatenation of the two hidden states, we're multiplying them by a matrix, putting through them through a tan h function, and then multiplying that by another vector where both the v and w are learned, and using that as an attention function. And so that's what they did in their work, and that worked pretty well. In the work we did at Stanford, so principally Tung Long's work, um, that um, we proposed using a different attention function, which is the one in the middle, which is this bilinear attention function, which has actually been quite successful and widely adopted. So here, it's kind of like the top one where you're doing a dot product, but you're sticking in between the dot product a mediating matrix W. And so that matrix can effectively then learn how much weight to put on different parts of the dot product to sort of have an idea of where to pay attention. And that's actually turned out to be a model that works kind of well. And I think there's a reason why it works kind of well, because what you would like to do is kind of have interaction terms that look at HT and HS together. And even the dot product kind of has this interaction between HT and HS. And this is a more sophisticated way of getting an interaction between HT and HS. Whereas if you're using this model with only a single layer of neural network, you don't actually get interactions between HT and HS because you've got the sort of two parts of this vector and each of them is multiplied by a separate part of this matrix. And then you put it through a tan H, but that just rescales it element wise. And then you multiply it by a vector, but that just rescales it element wise. So there's no place that HT and HS actually interact with each other. And that's essentially the same problem of the sort of classic result that you can't get an XOR function out of a one layer perceptron is because you can't get the two things to interact with each other. Um, so this is a very simple low parameter way in which you can actually have interaction terms and it seems to work really well for attention functions. It's not the only way that you could do it. Another way that you could do things that a couple of papers have used is to say, well, gee, a one layer neural net's just not enough. Let's make it a two layer feed forward network and then we can have arbitrary interactions again, like the XOR model, and a couple of people have also played with that. Um, another thing that has been explored for attention that I'll just mention, so the simple model of attention, um, you've got this attention function that spreads attention over the entire source encoding, and you've got a weighting on it. Um, that's kind of simple, it's easy to learn, it's a continuous, nice, differentiable model. It's potentially unpleasant computationally if you've got very long sequences, because that means if you start thinking about your backprop algorithm, that you're backpropagating into everywhere all the time. So people have also looked some at having local attention models where you're only paying attention to a subset of the states at one time, and that's more of an exact notion of retrieving certain things from memory. And that can be good, especially for long sequences. Um, it's not necessarily compellingly better um, just for the performance numbers so far. 
Okay, so here's a chart that shows you how some of the performance um, works out. So what we see is that if you, this red model has no attention, and so this shows the result that a no attention model works reasonably well up to sentences of about length 30, but if you try and run a no attention machine translation system on sentences about uh, beyond length 30, performance just starts to drop off quite badly. Um, and so, you know, in some sense, this is a glass half full story. Um, the glass half full is actually LSTMs are just miraculous at, me at remembering things. I mean, I think quite to many people's surprise, you can remember out to about length 30, which is actually pretty stunning. Um, but nevertheless, um, there's magic and there's magic, and you don't get an infinite memory. And if you're trying to translate sentences that are 70 words long, you start to suffer pretty badly with the basic LSTM model. Oops. Um, okay, um, so then the models that are higher up um, is then showing um, models with attention, and I won't go through all the details. Um, the interesting thing is that even for these shorter sentences, actually there are a lot of gains from putting attention into the models, that it actually does just let you do a much better job of working out where to focus on at each generation step, and you translate much better. But the most dramatic result is essentially these curves turn into flat lines, you know, there's a little bit of a peak here maybe, but essentially you can be translating out to 70 word sentences without your performance going downhill, and that's interesting. Um, the one thing that you might think freaky about all of these charts is that they all go downhill for very short sentences. Um, that's sort of weird, but I think it's, I think it's sort of just a, just a weirdo fact about the data, that it turns out that the things that are in this kind of data, which is European Parliament data, actually, that are five word sentences, they just aren't sentences like, I love my mum, which is a four word sentence that has a really simple grammatical structure, that when you're seeing five word things, that they're normally things like titles of acts, or that they're half sentences that were cut off in the middle and things like that, so that they're sort of weirdish stuff, and that's why that tends to prove hard to translate. Okay, um, here are just a couple of examples of giving you again some examples of translations. So we've got a source, a human reference translation, then down at the bottom we have the LSTM model, and above it it's putting in attention. Um, so for this sentence, it does a decent job, the base model of translating it, except for one really funny fact. It actually sticks in here a name that has nothing whatsoever to do with the source sentence. And that's something that you actually notice quite a bit in neural machine translation systems, especially ones without, trans without attention, that they're actually very good language models so that they generate sentences that are good sentences of the target language, but they don't necessarily pay very much attention to what the source sentence was, and so that they kind of go, okay, I'm generating a sentence and a name goes there, stick in some name, and let's get on with generating. It's got nothing to do with the source sentence. Um, that gets better in the other example where it actually generates the right name. That's an improvement. Um, here's a much more complex example where there's various stuff going on. Um, one thing to focus on, though, is that the source has this not incompatible, um, whereas the base model um, translates that as not compatible which is the opposite semantics, um, whereas our one here, um, we're then getting the incompatible, so not incompatible. So that's definitely an improvement. Um, none of these translations are perfect. I mean, in particular, one of the things that they do wrong is safety and security, where in the translation, um, we have exactly the same word, so it's of the form A and A. Now, this word, you know, really safety and security have a fairly similar meaning, so it's not actually so unreasonable to translate either of those words with this word, but clearly you don't want to translate safety and security as safety and safety. That's just not a very good translation. Um, so that could be um, better. Um, I'll go on. Yeah, so this idea of attention and, um, 
has been a great idea. Another idea that's been interesting is the idea of coverage, that when you're attending, you want to make sure you've attended to different parts of the input. And that was actually an idea that sort of, again, first came up in vision. So people have done caption generation, where you're wanting to generate a caption that summarizes a picture. And so one of the things you might want to do is when you're paying attention to different places, you want to make sure you're paying attention to the different main parts. So you both want to pay attention to the bird and you want to pay attention to the background. So you're producing a caption that's something like a bird flying over a body of water. And so you don't want to miss important image patches. And so that's an idea that people have also worked on in the neural MT case. So one idea is an idea of doing sort of attention doubly. And so you're sort of working out an intention in both directions. So there's a horizontal attention and a vertical attention. And you're wanting to sort of make sure you've covered things in both directions. Okay, so that's sort of one idea. And in general, something interesting that's been happening is in the last roughly year, I guess, um, that essentially people have been taking a number of the ideas that have been explored in other approaches to machine translation and building them into more linguistic attention functions. So one idea is this idea of coverage. But actually, if you look in the older literature for word alignments. Well, there are some other ideas that are in those older um, machine translation word alignment models. Um, some of the other ideas were an idea of position. So normally attention or alignment isn't completely sort of random in the sentence. Normally, although there's some reordering, stuff near the beginning of the source sentence goes somewhere near the beginning of the translation, and stuff somewhere near the end of the source sentence goes towards the end of the translation. And um, that's an idea you can put in to your um, attention model as well. And a final idea is fertility. Um, fertility is sort of the opposite of coverage. It's sort of saying it's bad if you pay attention to the same place too often. Because sometimes one word is going to be translated with two words or three words in the target language. That happens. But if you're translating one word with six words in your generated translation, that probably means that you've ended up repeating yourself. And that's another of the mistakes that sometimes um, neural machine translation systems can make, that they can repeat themselves. And so people have started to build in those ideas of fertility as well. Okay, um, any questions or people good with attention? Um, so the question is that when we were doing the attention function, we were just doing it based on, we were just doing it based on the hidden state. And another thing that we could do is actually put in the previous word, um, the XT, and also put that into the attention function. Um, so, I mean, one answer is to say, yes, of course you could, and you could go off and try that. Um, and see if you could get value from it. Um, and you know, it's not impossible you could. I, I suspect it's less likely that that's really going to work because I think a lot of the time what you get with these LSTMs is that the hidden state in, to a fair degree is still representing the word that you've just read in, but it actually has the advantage that it's kind of a context disambiguated representation of the words. So one of the really useful things that LSTMs do is that they're sort of very good at word sense disambiguation because you start with a word representation 
which is often the kind of average of different senses and meanings of a word. And the LSTM can use its preceding context to decide, okay, well really in this context, I should be representing this word in this way. And you kind of get this word sense disambiguation. So I suspect most of the time that the hidden state records enough about the meaning of the word and actually improves on it by some of this using of context that I'm a little doubtful whether that would give gains. On the other hand, I'm not actually aware of someone that's tried that. So, you know, it's totally in the space of someone could try it and see if you can get value from it. Yes. Uh, yes, there's a very good reason to use an LSTM as your generator even though you're going to do attention, which is the most powerful part of these neural machine translation systems remains the fact that you've got this neural language model as your generator, which is extremely powerful and good as a fluent text generator. And that's still being powered by the LSTM of the decoder. Um, and so, and no, I, the power you get from the LSTM at better remembering the sort of longer short term memory is really useful as a language model for generation. So I'm sure that that's still giving you huge value and you'll be much worse off without it. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing that you could wonder is in this picture, I'm still feeding the final state in to initialize um, the LSTM for the, for the decoder. Do you need to do that or could you just cross that off and start with a zero hidden state and do it all with the attention model? That might actually work fine. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, so where would I have that? Oh, here. Okay, yeah. So in the, in the simple case, if you sort of are making a hard decision to um, pay attention to only a couple of places, um, that's a hard decision and so that then kills differentiability. And so that's the easy, so the easiest way to sort of keep everything kind of nice and simply differentiable is just to say use global attention, um, put some attention weight on each position, it's um, differentiable the whole way through. So if you're making a hard decision here, um, traditionally the most correct way to do this properly and train the model is to say, okay, we have to do this as reinforcement learning because doing a reinforcement learning system lets you get around the non-differentiability and then you're in this space of deep reinforcement learning which has been very popular lately. And there are a couple of papers that have used local attention which have done it using reinforce as deep reinforcement learning training. Um, so in the paper that Tang did, that's not what he did. Um, he sort of, I think it's true to say that to some extent he sort of fudged the non-differentiability but it seemed to work okay for him. But I mean this is actually an, an area in which there's been some recent work in which people have explored methods which in some sense um, are continuing this tradition of fudging but putting it on a more of a theoretical footing and finding this works very well. So an idea that's been explored quite a bit in recent work is to say in the forward model we're going to be making some discrete choices as to which positions to pay attention to. In the backwards model we're going to be using a soft approximation of those decisions and we will then um, do the backwards um, back propagation using that. So that the kind of idea is um, you're working out say where to pay attention and you're choosing the states with a sort of a high need for attention as a hard decision. But in the backwards model, um, you're then having a sort of a soft attention still and you're training with that. And so that leads into ideas um, like the straight through ex estimator which has been explored um, by Yoshua Bengio's group and other recent ideas of gumball softmaxes and things like that. And that's actually sort of, 
been worked out as another way to explain, another way to train these not really differentiable models, which is in some ways easier than using reinforcement learning. I'll go on. Um, there was one other um, last thing I did want to sort of squeeze in for the end of today is I, I just wanted to say a little bit about what's, um, okay, um, so for assuming that we've, you know, at source time we've got our source sentence and we encode it in some way that we're going to make use of. At decoders that really our decoders are just saying, okay, here's the meaning we want to convey, produce a sentence um, that expresses that meaning, and how can we do that decoding successfully? And I just sort of wanted to mention for a couple of minutes what are the options and how do they work. So, you know, one thing in theory we could do is say, okay, well let's just explore every possible sequence of words that we can generate up to a certain length. Let's score every one of them with our model and pick the best one. So we'd literally have an ex exhaustive search of possible translations. Now that's obviously completely impossible to do because not only is that exponential in the length of what we generate, um, we have this enormous vocabulary. It's not even like we're doing exponential on a base of two or three. We're doing exponential on a base of 100,000 or something like that. So that can't possibly work out. Um, so the obvious idea and the first thing that people do is, oh, sorry, I'll get to the obvious one next. Um, the second thing, <laughs> um, the, the not quite so obvious but the probabilistically nice and good thing to do is to do a sampling based approach, which is in a sort of a successive sampling. So you, it's sometimes referred to as ancestral sampling. So what we're doing then is we've generated up to word t minus one and then saying, okay, Based on our model, we have a probability distribution over the teeth word, and so we sample from that probability distribution one symbol at a time, and we keep on generating one word at a time until we generate our end of, sim end of sentence symbol. So we generate a word, and then based on what we have now, we do a probabilistic sample of the next word, and we continue along. So if you're a theoretician, that's the right practical thing to do because if you're doing that, you've got an not only an efficient model of generating and like the first model, but you've got one that's unbiased, asymptotically exact, um, great model. Um, if you're a practical person, this is not a very good thing to do because what comes out is very high variance and it's different every time you decode the same sentence. Okay, so the practical easy thing to do, which is the first thing that everybody really does, um, is a greedy search. So we've generated up to the T minus one word, we want to generate the teeth word, we use our model, we work out what's the most likely word to generate next, and we choose it, and then we repeat that over and generate successive um, next words. So that's then a greedy search. We're choosing the sort of best thing given the preceding subsequence, but that doesn't guarantee us the best whole sentence because we can kind of go wrong in any number of ways because of our greedy decisions. So it's super efficient, but it's heavily suboptimal. So if you want to do a bit better than that, which people commonly do, the next thing that you think about trying is then doing a beam search. So for a beam search, we're up to word t minus one, and we say, gee, what are the five most likely words to generate next? And we um, generate all of them, and we have our beam of five. And then when we go on to generate word t plus one, we say for each of those sequences up to length t, what are the five next, 
five most likely words to generate as the T plus first word, and we generate all of them. And well, then we've got 25 hypotheses, and if we kept on doing that, we'd again be exponential, but with a smaller base. But we don't wanna do that, so we, what we do is say, well, out of those 25, which are the five best ones? And we keep those five best ones, and then we generate five possibilities from each of those um, for the T plus two time. And so it, we maintain a constant size K hypotheses, and we head along and do things. Um, so, you know, as K goes to infinity, um, that becomes unbiased, but in practice our K is small, so it is biased. Um, it doesn't necessarily monotonically improve as you increase K, but in practice it usually does up to some point at least. It turns out that often there's a limit to how big you can go for it improving, which might even be quite small, because sometimes you actually tend to get worse if, you're, if your model's not very good and you explore things further down. Um, it's not as efficient, right, that your efficiency is going down in K squared. So, you know, as soon as you're at a beam of 10, your two orders of magnitude slower than the greedy search. But nevertheless, it gives good gains. Um, so um, here, are some results, and um, so this is from work again of Kang Hyun Cho's. So in the middle here, we have the greedy decoding, and um, we're getting these numbers like 15.5 and 16.66. And so something I haven't actually done yet is explained machine translation evaluation. Um, and that, that's something that I'll actually do in the next lecture. Um, but big is good um, for these scores. Um, so what you see is that if you sort of sample 50 translations and go with the best one, that the, although that gives you some improvement over the greedy one best, the amount of improvement it gives you isn't actually very much because there's such a vast space that you're sampling from and it's quite likely that most of your 50 examples are sampling something bad. On the other hand, if you're using a fairly modest beam of size five or 10, that's actually giving you a very good and noticeable gain, much bigger than you're getting from the ancestral sampling. And so that's basically the state of the art for neural machine translation, is people do beam search with a small beam. The good news about that actually is in statistical phrase-based machine translation, people always used a very large beam. So people would typically use a beam size of size 100 or 150, and really people would have liked to use larger, apart from where it was just computationally too difficult. But what people have found with neural machine translation systems is small beams like five or 10 actually work extremely well. And conversely, bigger beams often don't work much better. Okay, and so that gives us sort of beam search with this small beam as the de facto standard in, in MT. Okay, that's it for today, and we'll have more of these things on next Tuesday.